And I've got this lucky Timberwolf hat. It's black and it's got a Timberwolf uh, symbol on the front of it. And whenever I wear it, they win. And when I don't wear it, they lose. So I brought the hat to church today to show you, and I've lost it. I can't find it any place. So I thought, you know, I, I looked in my office, I looked under the desk, I, I, looked, I looked up here. I don't know where I, I put it, so I thought maybe you could help me uh, find my hat today with all these people here. If you search around, maybe you can find it. Do you think you can find it? Do you think, can, can you help it? it? It's on my bed. No, 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 no. I didn't leave it at home. I didn't leave it on my bed. I said I brought it to church today, so it's not on my bed at home. It's, it's here. In, in the church someplace, I, 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 if, if you kind of maybe would look around, can anybody else help me? No, it's not red. I told you, it's black. You people are not listening to me. It's not, it's not red. It's a black hat, and it's, it's, it's got the, the Timberwolf symbol on it. So, um, you guys looking around? Can somebody find it for me? I where it is. Where? Right here. It's on my head. Why didn't you tell me that in the first place? It's on my head. Well, okay. Have you ever done that? Anybody here want to admit? I feel really stupid, but I don't feel quite as stupid because I know you've done it too. Your glasses, you're looking around for your glasses. Where are they? They're on your head. It's a little more embarrassing to do it in front of a crowd. It was really embarrassing this past week um, there's two TV shows that we watch faithfully. One of them is called The Amazing Race. And uh, on The Amazing Race, this past Sunday night, there was a team. They have teams of two people, and there were two women. And you get a clue, and you open it up, and you read the clue, and then you have to do what the clue says, go where it says, whatever. But you have to keep that clue. It's very important to keep that clue. And there was a woman. Um, she had just finished their task, and she suddenly said, I lost my clue. I can't find the clue. And she's looking around for it. And, and her teammate's going, I don't, you, what you do with it? She's looking over and she, I don't know what to do with it. And all of a sudden she starts and she goes, oh, it's in my mouth. <laughs> so I'm not the only one. We all do it. We've got things right in front of our face, and yet we can't find them. Hang on to that thought for a while. Uh, we'll come back to it a little later. But last week we started with a, with a two-week series uh, on hide and seek. Talking about hiding and seeking. And last week we talked about the fact that there are times in our life when it seems as if we're it and God is hiding someplace. God is hiding in a really good place because we just can't find him. We read the scripture. You remember the scripture was from Psalm 10. And the psalmist says in the first verse, Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? So we talked about what it's like to be searching for God because God somehow seemingly has left us. Well, today's scripture, I want to go to that right now, <coughs> that Luann read for you, sheds a different light on things. So let's take a little look at this story. It's a familiar story. We... We all remember the story from, from Sunday school, the story of Adam and Eve, <coughs> an attempt to explain not only creation, but it's a story that attempts to explain why it is that we, the human race, seem to be so separated from God. What's, what's wrong between humankind and God? And so this story seeks to explain that. It starts out with um, this creature called a serpent, who comes and explains to the woman, or asks the woman, can you eat of any tree of the garden? There's all these trees in the garden, and she says, well, of course we can. Well, except one tree. There's one tree that God said we should not eat from. But otherwise, we can eat from all the rest of the trees. And, and the serpent looks at her and says, well, you could eat from that tree. There's no reason you couldn't. And there wasn't any reason why she couldn't, except that God had said, don't do it. But she could still do it. That's the point of the story. She would still have the ability to do it. So she takes the tree, she eats from it, her eyes are open, she gives it to her, to, the, to Adam, <coughs> and, and his eyes are open. And, and this is, this is really key to the whole story, they saw that they were naked, their innocence was lost. 
They recognized their position before God and they clothed themselves and then they hid themselves from God. <coughs> so notice the difference between this story and the reading last week from Psalm 10. Last week, the psalmist is saying, God, where have you hidden yourself? But in the story today, what we discover is that the humankind has hidden themselves from God. And it's God who is in the <coughs> garden looking for them. And he says, where are you? Where are you? They'd hidden themselves. If you go on in the story, they'll, they'll, they come out and say, well, we, 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 were, you know, we were trying to hide from you. Well, of course, you can't hide from God. But that's the point of that story. The real question isn't, where is God? The real question is, why have we separated ourselves from God? Why is it that God seems far off from us, when in point of fact, God is as near to us as our next breath? God is as near to us as the hat I had on my head, and yet I couldn't find it. Why is it that if God is so close to us, that there are times in our lives when we feel like God has abandoned us, that God is far off someplace, that God is hiding on some, in some corner of the universe, and we cry out to God, and God doesn't answer. It's not God's fault. It's not God who has abandoned us. It's we who have abandoned God. So what is it that prevents us from finding God? What is it that separates us from God? I asked you last week, I gave you another assignment. I want you to know that this week I had five times as many responses as last week. Last week I had one. This week I had five. So thank you to the five people who responded. I had some good responses too. One of the questions I asked was, you know, where do we find God? Well, one of the persons said, that I find God when I stop being a Martha and I start being a Mary. Now, you know, that refers to the story of Mary and Martha. Martha was busy with many things. One of the things that keeps us from God is our busyness. Now, there's a time to be busy. There's a time to be a Martha. But there's also a time to <coughs> slow down and be a Mary. You ever have one of those mornings where you get up and you, you've already thought out the next three hours. You've got so much you've got to do. Sometimes I get up and, and I just can't wait to get to the office because I, I just want get, to get stuff done because it just seems like there's so much there. And I rush to get going. And I get through the whole day and then look back and realize that I didn't take any time. I didn't take any moments to reflect upon my relationship with God. I try to do that every morning. I try to at least read something from the upper room and have a little prayer time, read some scripture, whatever it is. But some days it's just, you get too busy. God is there. But where are we? We're off doing our busy work. No wonder it's hard to find God when we're so busy. And we put a high value on being busy too, don't we? If we're not busy, we're afraid somebody might think we're lazy. So one of the things that keeps us from God finding God is our busyness. Or maybe it's because we look in the wrong places. When we play hide and seek as children. We're looking all over the house trying to find those who are hiding. We, until we look in the right place, we're not going to find them. We may look in the closet. We may look under the bed. If they're not there, we're looking in the wrong places. Are we looking for God in the right places? Or are we trying to find God in other things? In pleasure? In the accumulation of material things? In money? A lot of people are looking in the wrong place. If you want to find God, you better look in the right place. It's not after the things of this world that we find God. Sometimes it might be pride. Pride that gets in our way. I can do it myself. I don't need God. Why would I need God when I can do it myself? We live in a culture today 
especially in this culture of the Western world that puts a high premium on, on being self-sufficient. We're a part of a legacy of pioneers who went out into the, the prairie. And they dug up the earth themselves. They survived that first winter by their own strength. And we come away with it, come away from that with this idea that you know, we can do it ourselves. If you just stick your mind to it, you can do it. Of all the phrases you were taught growing up, you can do anything you stick your mind to. I don't need God. Why should I look for God when I don't need God? And another thing that keeps us from God is we're just mad at God or we blame God. Now here I want to pause a little bit because I said last week that I would spend some time answering this question. One of the questions I asked you last week, because people will use this all the time, they'll say, well, I, I, I either don't believe in God or I believe there's a God but I don't really want anything to do with God because of all the suffering in the world. How could God allow, you know, and you, you, you can fill in the blanks. How could God allow a two-year-old little child to die of cancer? How could God have allowed my mother to die when I was just a child? How could God, if, if there is a God, how could God, a loving God, do such a thing? So we play the blame game. Or it's our anger towards God and that pushes God away. Or we just deny that there is a God. Now, of the five people who responded to my questions, one of them actually responded to that one. And she gave me a very good answer. Thought she was in my confirmation class. She gave such a good confirmation answer. But the answer is found in, so I just want to take a moment to step away and just answer that question in the way I understand it. And it goes back to our scripture reading this morning. Why is there evil in the world? If, if God is a loving God, if God cares for us, why is there evil in the world? Why is there suffering in the world? And if we don't have an answer for that, uh, a lot of people are just going to walk away because they're looking for an answer. Because they're having a hard time with that, with that whole question. So how do you answer somebody who says, how can I believe in a God, a loving God, who would allow whatever it is to happen? And the answer is, in, as I said, in the story today. In that story, when the serpent came to the woman and said, can you eat of any tree? She said, yes, except one tree. Well, she could eat of that tree. She did eat of that tree. Because God gave her and the whole human race the ability to make choices. When God created the human race, he gave us that wonderful gift. You see, God started with nature. And um, he made beautiful nature, but it wasn't enough for God. He had the sunrises and the sunsets and the beauty of the autumn leaves and all of that. But that wasn't enough for God, so God created animals. So God had little puppy dogs and little kittens, and that was fine too, but that wasn't enough for God. God created humankind. Why? Because God wanted to have a relationship that was a two-way relationship with something. And he couldn't have that relationship with nature. He couldn't have it with animals, but he could have it with humankind. He could love humankind, and in response, humankind could love God back. That's what God desired. That's what God wanted. But there's only one problem you understand with love. You know what that problem is? You can't force somebody to love. I may love you, but, but, but I can't force you to love me. God could love us, but God could not, if it was truly going to be love, God could not force humankind to, to love in return. God had to give humankind the option, the choice, to love or not to love. Because if he forced all of us to love, it wouldn't be love. If he forced all of us into his mold to serve him and to honor him, we'd be no more than robots. And so God had to take the chance. God had to say, I, I'm going to give them the gift of choice. And I don't think we'd want it any other way. But there's a problem with choice. And that is sometimes what? We make the wrong choice. Sometimes we make very wrong choices. And it leads to a lot of suffering and heartache and pain. And there's a lot of that in the world today. There's a lot of bad choices being made. There always have been. And people have suffered because of it. Those who make the wrong choices suffer. 
But because we're community and we're all a part of this world, sometimes because I make a wrong choice, you suffer as a result. That happens all the time. And I understand there are some things that are beyond our understanding of whose bad choice led to this suffering. There's some things that just happen. We call them acts of God. Maybe someday we'll learn that there's more behind it than what we understood. I don't understand all of that. What I do understand is that it's a wonderful gift that God has given to us. And unfortunately, we have to suffer because of it. And so that's the reason why there's evil in the world. It's not because God wants evil. It's not because God created evil. It's not because God couldn't prevent it. But if God prevented it, then he would have to take away our gift of choice. That's my answer. May not be perfect. That's the best I can do. And it's unfortunate that we have to suffer because of it. But on the other hand, because of the gift of choice, we also have the opportunity to experience God in a wonderful way. And I asked you that question too, and, and the, the people who responded came up with some wonderful answers. I said, where do you find God? Where do you find In the midst of all of this in the world today, suffering, pain, sorrow, all the war and everything, but where do you find God? And I had several answers. Uh, some, somebody said they find God in music. Beautiful, um, beautiful music stirs them, and, and, and they can feel God's presence in that. Someone else, and, and several people actually said this, that when, someone said, when I pay attention to the beauty of nature, to sunrise, to sunset, to the leaves turning into fall, when I see the beauty of nature, I see God. Someone said that they see God in the people around them. Through the examples or the words of other Christians. In the way that people act towards other people. In the way that Jesus would want us to. They see God. Someone else said they see God by looking back over the years and seeing the ways in which God has already touched them. And been there for them especially in trying to do this. Someone else said, and I thought this was really good, he says, we can find God everywhere if we have a positive attitude. It would indicate that a negative attitude is a barrier to finding God. If we're just positive, we'll see God. We'll find God in the world around us. And so the point of the hat today and the point of the story today is that God isn't far off. God is right in front of us. And, and if we're searching for God, it's because we're not looking in the right place. God is right next to you right now. We've come together today to worship God because we believe that God is in this place. That God is here to meet us. And if we feel... Apart from God, separated from God, and we all do at times. That's when our faith has to kick in and we just have to believe and trust. And begin to look for God. Knowing that God is there to find us as soon as we turn to God. Let's pray. Lord, we confess that sometimes we have a hard time with you. Sometimes we have a hard time understanding your ways. Sometimes we feel as, as though we're estranged from you, that you are afar off someplace. But help us to realize, Lord, that you did not create us to be apart from you. That you created us to be in a relationship with you. And that you are never far off. But that you are right here with us. When we ask, where are you, God? You answer, I am right here. Look for me. Turn to me. If there's anyone here today, Lord, who's feeling particularly alone, estranged from you, help them, Lord. Help them to turn to you right now. 
Help them to experience you in a new way, in a fresh way, in a reassuring way. Lord, we pray.